If you couldn't tell from my previous video, I'm still going through my nostalgia fueled binge through older shows to distract from the hellscape that is 2020 in Northern Ireland. If media is my equivalent to crack, I will gladly hook that shit into my veins. Because with everything going on right now, I think we all need a reprieve from life sometimes. In the past few months, I think we've all found different ways of coping. Some start exercising, some take up new hobbies. Me, being the recluse that I am, I've been playing a lot of video games. As disappointing as that sounds to many of the parents watching this, I think in many ways games have been some of the best tools for communication between me and my friends over this period of time, whether it's visiting each other's islands in Animal Crossing or debating who's best girl in Fire Emblem Free Houses. It's Bernadetta, come on. Why wouldn't I be called? This spare time has allowed me to work through many of the titles in my backlog, checking them off this seemingly never-ending list. If you've noticed a pattern, a lot of the media I've talked about on this channel so far have been purely fantastical, which might lead you to believe that I'd take the next logical step and talk about something in a similar vein. Maybe about a game set in a high school, with a time management system, focusing on an outsider thrown into an environment that demonizes him, and leads to a journey of reforming the status quo, and maybe let you date multiple girls at once for your piece of shit? Well, you've come to the right place because we are finally diving into the world of Bully. Okay, no, I'm not gonna be talking about Persona 5. I don't dislike it, I think it's all right, it has its charms, it's just, you know, it's maybe just a little- Keep that shit to yourselves! Bully is an unusual part of Rockstar's catalogue, not being nearly as popular as their powerhouse brands like Grand Theft Auto or Red Dead Redemption, but being referenced more frequently than some of their more niche titles. Like, you're more likely to hear about Bully rather than Frasher or their table tennis game? As you'd expect from its title and the developer's reputation, at its release the game was highly controversial, with some describing it as a juvenile delinquency simulator. With its more unrestrained, grounded violence seen by many as pushing the limits of taste at the time, it was banned from the likes of Brazil, while other countries rebranded the title into the in-game school motto of Canis Canum Edit, which translated from Latin stands for Dog Eat Dog. <laughs> I straight up didn't know this until doing research for this video, and I think that translation gets just as much right about the game's setting and tone, but also how a lot of people have misinterpreted what this game actually is. Bully is considerably tamer compared to its more overtly loud and hyperbolic older brothers. From its secluded setting to the limitations placed on the player, even at its release on the PlayStation 2, when so many games were granting more and more freedom, it'd be easy just to shrug it off as nothing substantial. But, as you can tell from me making this video, along with how, over a decade and a half later, people still hold this game in such high regard, I figured now was the time to go back to Bullworf to see why this underrated gem still holds a place in people's hearts, and why any potential news of a sequel is met with delight. But before we get to that, it's worth having a little chat about what open world games are now, and what makes the world of Bully stand out. And I think there's no better place to start than with the main character, uh, no, not you. Oh, definitely not you. Ah, there we go. In many ways, I think open world games are home to some of the best experiences in contemporary gaming, but it's also the genre I've grown the most disinterested in. A large appeal of these titles is the freedom associated with them, typically showcasing a large variety of content in their missions and activities, coupled with offering a more personalized experience, letting you forego the narrative completely and just letting you get lost in the sandbox that's been created. To be clear, I don't think this has been a bad evolution. In many ways, I think having the ability to create larger, more detailed worlds has allowed for developers to create more immersive experiences. At the time of writing, we are only a few months away from the PlayStation 5 and new Halo box releasing, which only means that games will keep getting bigger and more detailed. But I think this advancement in scale has also led to what I'm gonna call a loss of intimacy. I think placing the player in a more confined setting allows for the locations to be brought into focus and having them engage more with the environment. 
in so many open world games, even the really good ones, have this unfortunate side effect of its sandbox feeling so large that traversing it feels like a chore, and often the visual stimuli can't hide the lack of content in many of these areas. Like, I could tell you so much more about Arkham City's streets, how each of the different factions occupy a different part of the map, and how progression in the story actively changes that dynamic, compared to any of the empty deserts or forests or the cities that are in Final Fantasy XV. Sure, one might be more detailed, but which one of these do you think sticks with you more? And this is where Bulworth Academy comes into place. From the opening cutscene, we get everything we need to know about the mishandled boarding school, from its old architecture to the high-angle panning camera shots that give this lonely, isolated feel to the environments we will be traversing, there's a clear intention encoded to say that this place is a nightmare. And sure, this doesn't sound like a big deal, but this detail is key in establishing the world building because Bulworth is just as important a character as many of the odd personalities you will be meeting which is another one of Bully's major strengths, which is its varied and extremely memorable cast of characters. Unlike Skyrim or GTA that use randomly generated NPCs to give the illusion of life, Bullworth and its surrounding neighborhoods are filled with distinct, recognizable characters, and the smaller size of the world let us suspend our disbelief in seeing them reappear, as well as letting their personalities shine. From the stern, clueless principal, to the homeless man living on campus who teaches you kung fu, to Scott the Waz here wanting to be the student president, there's plenty of personality given to even the smallest roles, and the interactions which give the world this real, lived-in quality. Like, this is a place that's existed long before you've arrived. Having an environment with personality makes us as a player want to see every nook and cranny. Sure, the graphics might have shown their age, and it could be a bit crass, but this kind of playful tone is much more appreciated in a world of standardized military shooters. As you can feel the team's reverence for the works of John Hughes and other 80s coming-of-age films such as Fast Times at Ridgemount High or Risky Business through the game's mission structure. There's no robbing cars or climbing a tower to reveal more of the map, Instead, you're pulling off pranks on other students while dressed as a skeleton, getting locked into a sewer version of Fight Club, or my personal favourite, destroying a rival Santa's grotto while the elves attack. Which is so utterly ridiculous and funny, it made my emotionless self crack a smile. While this kind of attitude could be a bit of a put-off for some people, what keeps us in some sense of reality is who we view the story through. As much like our playable character, we are thrust into this world with little fanfare, which introduces us to James Jimmy Hopkins. Who's the toughest? Me. Who's the man? Me. Me, losers. Me. If there's one unifying thread that connects Rockstar's protagonists, it's the idea that they've had it really rough in life and we're just picking up the pieces afterwards. From Max Payne to Nico Bellic, they've always done an exceptional job of giving these characters some form of trauma that doesn't have to be overly explained to us, and instead discovered through dialogue or in-game documents. An important component of backstories for any fictional character is that you shouldn't have to bore your viewer with every detail, but instead focus on the important positive or negative events that are still impacting the characters now. As John Truby's The Anatomy of Story puts it, the ghost is an event from the protagonist's past that still haunts them now. It's an open wound that is the source of their weakness. Max had his wife and child taken in a violent home invasion, while Nico runs away from his past as a soldier trying to start a new life. This serves as the character's driving motivation which influences how they interact with the world around them, and goes some way to help us relate to them. You know, as far as older male protagonists with guns are relatable. Which brings us to Jimmy, who takes this down-to-earth quality to its logical extreme, making him this 15-year-old who, despite his physical strength and level of awareness, simply cannot make the same meaningful changes to the status quo as his older, gruffer contemporaries. There are people in higher positions of power who control how things work, and this oppressive feeling is enforced through the game's day-to-day -day structure. Bully runs off an in-game clock that dictates the availability of certain activities, with one in-game hour taking one minute in real time, with story missions, classes, and side quests all being presented at different points. A lot of these classes are purely optional, but they do offer valuable upgrades to weapons and interactions, which can make progression easier or harder if you choose. What this get-what-you-put-in gameplay succeeds in is getting us to feel like we are actively shaping Jimmy into who we want to be. 
with a lot of the charm coming from his interactions with many of the strange characters we meet, which lets us see a different side to Jimmy. While he often uses this tough demeanor to belittle those he doesn't respect, beneath this exterior is ultimately someone who cares and will help those in need. As he puts it, We shall see, my friend. I only give people what they have coming to them. This could have easily come off as another one of those blank slate main characters for us to embody and do what the narrative says, but with his personality and especially Jerry Rosenfall's excellent voice performance adds, does so much to separate him from the countless other bland protagonists of other games at this time. This is important as having a somewhat more grounded main character helps give us something to cling on to when interacting with the other personalities, and the biggest of these comes in the form of Gary. Those kids are jerks anyway, but I tried. I know! I mean, I tried to do the right thing, make people happy, stop all the fighting, make everyone calm down. Now everyone laughs at me. People used to be scared of me, and now I'm a joke! It was Gary. It must have been. I know! I can't deal with the fact that that kid beat me! Who oh boy, Gary. Before there was Micah, there was Gary who easily ranks as one of the worst best friends in video games alongside Eddie Sparrow and that blue haired girl from Life is Strange. From the moment he steps into frame, we know that this is a kid who has been up to some shit. From his mannerisms and his sociopathic behavior, it gives us every reason to hate his guts. And what makes him an interesting opponent is how he's this dark reflection of Jimmy. Both had a similar upbringing and even share a physical similarity with the cuts on their faces which goes some way to explain the odd connection between the two. I genuinely hate the cliche of the antagonist giving the we're not so different kind of monologue, which always comes off as unconfident in the viewer to get the encoded messages. Like, I have this soft spot for Arkham Origins and love a lot of what that game does with the relationship between Batman and the Joker, but even it had that stupid line and it utterly killed momentum of the climax. But with Gary, through the information we learn about him from the other students and his actions we've seen, paint a deeply disturbed individual, and in some weird way, makes us curious to see what he'll do. Early on in the story, Gary takes Jimmy under his wing and shows him the ropes, and through these early interactions we see how the two handle the same situation differently. While Jimmy would typically use force, Gary uses his mind and words to manipulate conflicts to his liking with this ever-present sneer on his face. It makes it so easy to dislike him, and probably because we all knew someone like this back in school. Sure, none of my friends ever dressed up as a Nazi for Halloween, but this kind of rebel attitude leads to many of his missions being the highlight, in particular the final section with the entire school being turned into a lawless hellscape. Bullworth was always a bomb waiting to go off, Gary was just the fire that lit the fuse. So in simple terms... He's an asshole! But we can't help but see where this will take us. That leaves us with possibly Bully's crowning achievement, which is of course Sean Lee's inspired musical score which not only adapts to the different situations effectively, but also remains consistently catchy and playful throughout. I've been humming that main theme since Primary 5 every time I see a bike. Hopefully I'm not alone in that. All that said, considering how much praise I've given this game so far, if you're coming to Bully for the first time in 2020, I don't think you'll have the same rose-tinted positive view on it like I do, and after playing so many more recent open world titles, it does reveal many of the problems that I ignored when I was younger but now are just extremely frustrating. For example, throughout your playthrough you encounter different groups that have a certain click within the school, like your nerds, your docs, your greasers, etc. With each chapter having significant involvement from a particular group, and when you do something positive or negative, your rating will change with each individual one, that resulting in them either helping you or maybe becoming more antagonistic. But when doing a significant story mission, there's no prior knowledge given on how this will change your rating with a particular group, which can lead to your allies suddenly becoming enemies in a flash. So yeah, I have to admit this is one of those areas where Persona 5 is technically superior. Can't believe I had to say that. Along with that, the visuals are probably one of the biggest drawbacks to someone new. Even for 2006, the muddy look to the textures often gives this blurry, unappealing look to many of the interiors, and the models up close can be very unnerving. 
but for the most part, the cutscenes are well directed and the blocking slash staging goes a long way in helping hide the technical limitations, and the main cast still animate fairly well, so it's not totally unappealing. But the biggest by far is the game's controls. I've been playing this on the Xbox One with backwards compatibility, and the floaty, unfocused feel can often lead to you wanting to do one action, but accidentally doing something else entirely. So if you are going into this game for the first time, I will recommend going in with a pinch of salt. So, yeah. Bully is a game that has definitely shown its age, from its visuals, to its controls, to the crass humour that feels way less effective as it once did. But... In many ways, I think this kind of experience is what I miss most from games nowadays. There's always this push to be more ambitious, to have better graphics, to be bigger, to innovate on existing genres, all that stuff. And I think the vast majority of developers nowadays have just forgotten that sometimes a game being fun is more than enough. And to me, Bully is still fun. As the years go by, I still think fondly of it. And I'm clearly not alone in it, you still see people to this day dissecting the ins and outs of this game, trying to dig up every little secret that's been hidden, which in some small way has kept that playful nostalgic memory alive. Yes, it's very much a product of its time, and I think that's why Bully still sticks with me. It's a time capsule that reminds me of a simpler time, back when I could log in a full weekend on Horde mode of Gears War 2, or get lost in the portable adventures of Link and Zelda in Spirit Tracks. These trips down memory lane can often be a form of comfort, and getting to have these shared experiences with others, in my eyes, is the best thing that video games can do. And this is just one of those special titles that, even 14 years after its release, still has this timeless quality to it that me and so many other people remember it for. And I think we always will.